Hello, this is Pauline Jennings. Welcome to Musician Talk. Thank you to the Fairfield Bar for sponsoring today's show. The Fairfield Bar is a full service bar and restaurant in the heart of downtown Northfield at the corner of Highway 19 and 2nd Street in the Fairfield Inn Hotel Lobby. Their casual environment offers seating inside as well as on their 1,500 square foot deck overlooking the Cannon River. They have a wonderful selection of unique craft cocktails, local and regional beers on tap, and a well-rounded selection of wine. The Fairfield Bar has a delicious selection of scratch-made shareable plates, including favorites like made-to-order flatbreads, steak crostinis with balsamic glaze, and bang-bang shrimp tacos. Oh, that sounds wonderful. My stomach is grumbling just thinking about it. And they have new fall hours starting this week, Monday through Thursday from 4 to 10, and Friday and Saturday 4 to 11. Follow the Fairfield Inn by Marriott on Facebook and Instagram for updates and information. Now, I personally love the large deck on the Cannon River. I was there just the other night with some friends, and it is the perfect setting for a drink with friends and family or a night out with your special someone this fall. The Fairfield Bar is following the latest governor's ordinance and doing their part to help mitigate the COVID-19 virus. Stay safe and stay healthy. They look forward to welcoming you soon. My guest today is Marty Hodel. Marty holds a doctorate, along with a host of other degrees, in trumpet performance and has applied his education and talent as a soloist, chamber musician, and orchestral player in the U.S. and around the world. Marty has performed on a Prairie Home Companion, NPR, public television, and shared the stage with many heavy hitters in the jazz world, including Joe Henderson, as well as rock legend The Who. When not on stage, he's a trumpet professor at St. Olaf. He's certainly another musician that Northfield is lucky to have around. Let's find out more and talk to Marty Hodel. Hi, Marty. How are you doing? Terrific, Pauline. How are you? I am really good. It's great to have a chance to talk to you today. What an honor to be on your show. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's sweet. So I want to know how everything is different right now for you uh, leading up to uh, teaching at St. Olaf. You're a professor of music there. And I got to believe it's just a whole nother ball game this year. It's been really wild ride so far. Yeah. We have spent a lot of the spring and virtually all of the summer as faculty at St. Olaf, not just in the music department, but campus wide, trying to figure out how to bring students home here to campus safely and at the same time give them a very meaningful and rich experience for the music department and especially for performing artists within the department that has meant that we've had to change the number of students diminish the number of students that are allowed in any space at a given time so for example the orchestra room which had really no previous limits except for maybe fire code is now down to a maximum of 39 students and they are spaced apart Uh, nine feet or six feet for the string players. Furthermore, all students must be masked at all times, including instrumentalists. So flute players, clarinet players, all brass players have got to have masks on while they are playing. I wish I could show you this to your listeners, Um, a mask that has a little flap that opens that you can stick your French horn or tuba mouthpiece right into it. The flute masks have a hole on the side so that you can stick your flute in. Furthermore, there are bell covers that look basically like pantyhose that you have little elastic rings around at the end of all the bells, including the clarinets, the flutes, the oboes, the bassoons, all the brass instruments. And to have them play through those, which my students did last night in their first studio class, is really crazy. Lastly, we have to be out of the room after 40 or 30 minutes, depending on the type of instruments that are playing in the room. So the room needs to clear out the air for a good 30 minutes. Wow. Wow, I had no idea. Okay, so so you're covering the bells, and and bells you mean? That's where the sound and the air and the aerosols come out. There are certain instruments which, when you play them, actually create a lot more potential viral load in the air than just for example, a violin where you, you, you know, you're, there's no air going in or out of it. So any instrument that's a wind or brass instrument has a bell that 
the air generally comes out of or the end of the instrument. Wow. Like you see the trumpet players getting the spit out of the, out of the bell. Between. That's not the bell, actually. That's part of the body of the instrument. Got it. That's also a problem, and I'm glad you brought that up because we have got these puppy pads that we are using. I wish I could show your listeners those so that any brass player's condensation, we like to call it, Oh, sorry. Right I said spit. Sorry. Into the puppy pad rather than into the floor, because that can also contain virus that could sure. make people sick. How did you come up with all this? Uh, all these rules or all, all these ways to go get around getting the viral load into the air. Was there some guidance put out nationally for colleges or schools? Terrific question. There wasn't any national guidance, just like that. I don't think there's been any national guidance about how to work on uh, keeping ourselves safe. Yeah. However, there has been best practices that have been studied by a number of universities and performing arts organizations across the country and actually in Europe as well. So I was actually part of translating a few German studies where they studied exactly how many particles come out of your instrument and how those are dispersed in a room. And a lot of it has to do with how loud you play or sing. Singing can be really dangerous as well in terms of particle spread and particularly how well the ventilation system works. So if, you're, if you have a lot of air moving in a room and it's being sucked out an air outtake, the opposite of the vent, then you really are pretty safe. But if there's not too much air motion in there and you have a lot of students playing wind instruments or singing, the viral load can accumulate. And it's, you can think of it as uh, everybody's producing smoke, for example, in a room. And the more people that you have in there, the more smoke there is, the more chance of that smoke being inhaled by someone else. Think of smoke in relation to virus. So if you can smell somebody smoking, you know, maybe 30 feet away, you can probably somehow get part of their viruses, they say. Oh. Kind of scary, huh? Yeah, it is. But it's also astounding how many measures that all of you have taken there to, to stay safe. And that's really great to hear. I want to now take you back to when you first started playing trumpet. Was it your first instrument? How old were you? It's been well over half a century, or almost a half a century, I should say, that I've been, been playing trumpet. Um, and it happened starting the summer before my fifth grade year. So actually, I actually grew up in a, in a town that had a boys' choir that was part of the school system. It's a very small school system, so the elementary, middle school, and the high school are all in one complex. And we would have boys singing from soprano, alto, through their voice change to the tenor and bass section. And so I sang in that choir for nine years, and we met every day for nearly an hour during our regular school day. That was probably the single most important musical influence on, on me. I also started taking piano lessons in the third grade, and I continued for a number of years uh, well into high school taking piano. But there was someone in that boy choir, and this is the reason I brought it up, who I thought was pretty cool. His name happened to be David McKeon. He played trumpet, and he was really good, and he was very hip. You know, this is, of course, in the 1970s. Plus, I thought it was a kind of a cool instrument. So that's why it shows that that's David McKeon shows my life path for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great story. I love that. How old was that when you decided to? Ten do years old. Uh, yeah. And actually, my dad, who is a very fine amateur musician, um, showed me the fingerings and showed me how to buzz. He himself is a clarinet p player and a pianist and also a violist and a composer. But wow. he, he was the one that basically gave me my first lesson. And so I showed up to my very first band class, and I remember I played the fight song that day, and the, the band director was wondering, what is this guy? <laughs> how did that, how does he know that already? Wow, so you had some foundation there before you picked up the trumpet with your choir. I was choir. very fortunate that way, yeah. Yeah, with the choir and the piano. Awesome. Okay, so you started playing trumpet at 10. Then what? Where'd you go? What happened through high school? And well, I, I was as much a, a soloist as a singer than as a trumpet player, but I did sort of split those two. Um, and, you know, I, I did the requisite all state and all district bands. And I played, that was always the favorite part of uh, the year for me to go to these places where there were a lot of other instrumentalists who really cared about it, who practiced a little bit and who sounded good. I enjoyed being with people that I felt I could share a few things with a lot. And so that ultimately uh, helped me decide on a college where I knew that they had a really strong music program, which happened to be Goshen College in Indiana, a small liberal arts college in northern Indiana. 
So be, going to a smaller uh, college then gave you probably more opportunity to play. It sure did. Yeah, I was the quintessential large fish in a small pond there. There were other trumpet players too. And actually some of my, my biggest influences musically were my fellow trumpet players. Um, one of whom was, became my best friend and was a very good jazz player. So he got me into playing jazz in the college years, and that's been a very vital and important part of my life since. I unfortunately wasn't able to have any lessons. There was no teacher when, then anywhere close. I think I had one trumpet lesson when I was in the eighth grade, and you know he showed me how to hold the instrument a little better. But other than that, I just sort of picked up little tips from when I would go out to these workshops. And so to become such an incredible trumpet player without having a uh, teacher for very many years, there must have been some kind of innate ability inside of you. I, th I think the music has always come easy for me. Yeah. So that, that part of it, and I think I always had a pretty good sound on trumpet, but it's the physical and technical things that I just really didn't have a clue about. Like, you know, what are the best practices for blowing? What's fingering is good? You know, how do you hold your body? These elements of technique and things that really can bring you up to the next level were just completely foreign to me and I had to learn them basically from the ground up. So because so many students have really good teachers and have these methods early on, like in middle or high school or even before that, um, I had a lot of catching up to do. And did you find that relearning it or, or, or breaking bad habits is almost harder to, to learn something that the correct way than just starting from the beginning knowing how to do that? At the you nailed it. It sure is. Yeah. No question about it. And so that has actually helped me in my teaching because very many of my students have developed habits that I either had or have seen before. And as a result of me having to work through unlearning many years of muscle memory that was incorrect by playing in a more relaxed and correct way has been vital for my teaching. But that's a great point. And so it's made you more compassionate teacher. I hope so. Yeah, it's certainly it more understanding and I'm able to say, okay, you're not the only person that struggles with this. And in right. fact, I really struggled with this. That I think students immediately can identify to that and they're like, oh, maybe there's hope for me. That's awesome. When did you start playing, playing professionally? Well, that's a really good question. It's difficult to say because even in college, you know, I was taking some gigs here and there. They didn't pay a lot. So I was playing, you know, with some big bands. I think at that time uh, I played with uh, Temptations or the OJs. Uh, and I was playing out with a, a blues band. And I'm, I'm actually on a, a CD. My very first CD was with Maceo Parker, the, wow. the, the, who is James Brown's saxophone player. Um, and I didn't even know who he was until I brought a copy of this CD back to my jazz band. And I was like, hey, look, I'm on this CD. And they were, they were checking it out and goes, dude, you're on there with Maceo Parker. And I'm like, who's Maceo Parker? <laughs> He's this guy that was sitting next to me as awesome African-American jazz saxophonist. And, you know, it was super nice. And we just did a little session. Um, but after that, after my master's degree, I, I went full-time pro. And that's when I started working as a visiting artist, an artist in residence at a community college in North Carolina for two years. And my main job was to play out into the schools, civic organizations, it's a fantastic state-run program. I think it costs the state about a million dollars a year, which is a very small line item for 58 positions wow. in the entire country, and so, or in the, in the state, I should say, of North Carolina. And it also offered me the opportunity to be in the schools, and I organized a community jazz band. It was just an ideal situation for me right out of school. And so this made me think, I don't think I asked you, where did you grow up? I grew up in southeastern Kentucky in the mountains, heart of Appalachia, as we like to say. So it was a very small town, 3,000 people, um, but it had a lot of soul, and I, I treasure those years in that, that town. What happened to your Kentucky twang? Well, I can get it back if you want me to. All right, thank you. I was wondering where that went. <laughs> wow, wonderful. Where did you move to Minnesota? I moved to Minnesota in 1997 when I was hired at St. Olaf College. Got it. So I was a doctoral student at the Eastman School of Music in New York, in Rochester, New York at that time. And my trumpet teacher said, hey, you know, this might be a good first practice interview for you to do. I still had a, another year or so on my, on my degree. And after hearing the students that I coached in lesson, sample lessons here on campus and working with uh, a few of the 
people who would become my colleagues, I thought, I want this gig. Yeah. I want this job. And my background in singing actually helped me a lot in the interview. So I emphasize that the position as it was originally construed was for teaching music theory, which is another one of my areas. And I did a lot of singing and some piano playing in that. And I'm sure that didn't hurt me in the interview. So you moved to Minnesota in 1997. That's right. When did you get hooked up with the Minnesota Orchestra? Well, uh, it wasn't too long after that that I, I got to know a few of the players. Actually, one of the players uh, who joined the Minnesota Orchestra in about year 2000 was Chuck Lazarus. And Chuck Lazarus had been a member of a group that I also had played in, the Dallas Brass. So I used that connection partly, but also I just played for an extra list audition. Periodically, they'll ask players to come in just to play some trumpet excerpts to see if, you know, if they need a, an extra or a substitute player. And I got on the list and I started getting calls. So I think it was around 1999, uh, year 2000, that I started playing occasionally with the Minnesota Orchestra. That's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's imagine going and, you know, subbing in left field for the Minnesota Twins. That is really, really exciting, Marty. Now, what, has you, what have you been doing in the last year? Actually, I've been doing quite a bit more playing in the last four to five years with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. So they only have one full-time trumpet player, Lynn Erickson, who plays with them. And I've been doing a lot of the second, most of the second trumpet, actually, in that group since she plays a lot of the principal. So that's, your, that's the classical uh, work that you've been doing. How about the jazz work? Well, not too much. I do a lot more commercial work. So last year, for example, uh, before the summer, I mean, right at the end of summer, I w played with Weird Al Yankovic, played lead with his band oh, cool. at the State Fair. And then the next week after that, week and a half, I was playing lead with The Who. So my wife happened to show up for that and she said, you have got to fix your hair because you're on the Jumbotron right in front of Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey. I am having a hard time breathing. The Who is my favorite band. I was singing time. along a lot backstage. The, the rest of the trumpet section was like, why are you singing so much? Because this is the band that I grew up with. So to be able oh. to, to be on stage making music with heroes, legends, really. Yes. Chills the whole yes. time. Well, congratulations. That is really, really cool, Marty. Thank you for that wonderful synopsis from uh, fifth grade to today uh, of your musical journey. That, that's wonderful. I want to move on to um, this first song that you picked. It's uh, called Challenge by Marcus Stockhausen. I want you to set it up for us while you picked it. Marcus is a jazz trumpet player and, uh, and one of the most amazing jazz players in Europe. And Marcus wrote this piece on a commission by our fraternal organization, the International Trumpet Guild. And the, the International Trumpet Guild's conference was to be in Minneapolis. And so the organizers of that conference asked me to premiere this piece. It's a world premiere piece for vibraphone and trumpet five pieces. They're short, but they're very much jazz oriented. And so, of course, the person that I would call is fellow Northfielder, David Hagedorn. Absolutely. An astonishingly successful and talented wow. artist, vibraphonist, and jazz musician and band leader. Mm -hmm. And because I've had the opportunity to play dozens of jazz concerts with him, and he's my colleague, great friend, I said, this is the guy I want to play with me. So we did the premiere together in Minneapolis. It got a lot of really good press. And then later, um, when I was recording my latest solo CD, which is still about to be released, we went to Minnesota Public Radio and recorded in Studio B. I'm astounded by your talent. Uh, and with that said, let's take a listen to this. Thank you.
This is Pauline Dennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk. My guest today is Marty Hodel, trumpeter extraordinaire, and you just heard him play on Stockhausen Movement Number 4 called Challenge. This song, I felt it took me on a journey, uh, an emotional journey. You have, a, you have drama, you have sweetness, you have um, you, you, an adventure. It's almost like a soundtrack. Yes, definitely. There's a, a, a cinematic character to this piece that I really appreciate. And I'm drawn very much to film scores. I'm drawn to the sort of music that you would have along with plays. And uh, this music uh, has kind of several different sections which are slightly different moods. The name of it, Challenge, um, really I think refers to the technical difficulties of yes. both the vibraphone and the trumpet part. But it definitely has that sense of uh, just lifting for a while and then just being very discombobulated at times. It's a crazy piece, but it's a lot of fun to play. And it was a, a really great thing to record with Dave Hagedorn, I'll tell you. Did you do it in one setting? How could you record this difficult of a piece uh, without just taking many, many takes and piecing it together? Is that how you did it? I'm not going to tell you how many takes there might have been on this Got piece. It. Understood. Except I will say... All good recordings, unless they're live recordings, have edits in them, and this certainly had its share of edits. But Absolutely. if you've got a really good editor, you're working with a metronome, and our producer, who is another one of my colleagues and happens to be the chair of the music department right now, Catherine Ananda Owens, said, okay, we're going to take it from measure 16 to measure 25, really make sure you hit your mark right there, and then we get our metronome going, and boom. We just take that thing, and if we don't get the one we do, we do it over, and then we sort of digitally put those together. And I hope that doesn't disappoint your listeners to understand that that's how most music is made these days. No, I think all of it. And, and even if it's not electronic, back in the analog days, you'd punch it in. So you'd get to the point, and the engineer would hit uh, record right where you're going to go over your bad note and then take the record button off once you're done because... You, can, you have the opportunity to listen back and say, okay, that's not in key, that's not quite the right rhythm, that's not, that's not as good as I want it to be. And that's what makes a record a record as opposed to, like you said, a live recording. Exactly. And you know what I was really surprised at? I've done a, a few recordings with the Minnesota Orchestra, and it's exactly the same thing. So they tend to be a little bit longer spans than we do when we're solo recording, but uh, it's, it's the same thing. And the producer will say, oh, stop. We don't quite have that. We need to go yeah. back and do this section here. And I imagine that a producer for an album like that for an orchestra has to have incredible ears. As far they as have assistants as well. So they have two or three people sitting at the table with a gigantic yeah. score, and then everybody comes back, including the conductor who's sitting at the table. It's a really amazing experience to watch them work. I bet. I bet. Well, you know, music has been so important in your life, uh, it seems to me, since the beginning. Uh, I want you to talk to me about the importance, how music matters to you and what, what it's given to you in your life. Wow, what an amazing question. Yeah. And it's, it's one that it's impossible to, to overstate its importance. So rather than you saying, you know, I do music, or music is, I love music, I think you should say, I am a music. And I don't mean that in any sort of pretentious way, but my identity and my very core is a musician. And so frequently, emotions, even technical things, are expressed musically. And the things that really move me in a worship setting or in a, in a concert setting, those things are the are the heart of what I feel and they feed me just like food does. So that's part of it, of course, the intensity of emotion and what it, what it means to me. And partly it's also, it's my job. So there's a lot of days when I don't feel like playing or I don't want to make music, but because I know I have a big concert coming up, I have to practice anyhow. So we all have to figure out ways to when we don't feel like making music or practicing to do it anyway. It's our job. And thirdly, teaching music, being able to share what's meant so much to me uh, is really impossible for me to strip from my identity. So I'm constantly getting fed by working with students and seeing their reactions and their growth as musicians. It's completely rewarding. I love that statement, it feeds me, because that kind of covers it all. It's basic to life for you. And I might add one thing, and that is... The response that I see from other people when I'm at my best and I'm giving something that I know that's making a difference to them really mean, is meaningful for me. 
yeah, bringing that joy to have them go through that experience with you is, you're right. It is, it, it touches your soul. That's for sure. Absolutely. And just to get a little bit more philosophical, how has it enhanced or otherwise your relationships and the way that you see the world and the way you react, interact with the world? Well, that's also a great question. I think it comes down to human and personal connections. So the fact that my parents were both amateur musicians and I was stewing in music from early, since before I was born, that that is the first connection probably, obviously. But um, in later life, in adult life, the, the relationships I made with my teachers, who are some of my best friends, or my students, who I regard as, as my closest friends, and my colleagues, these amazing instrumental musicians who are playing in the opera orchestra or Minnesota Orchestra or St. Paul Chamber Orchestra or my brass quintet. These are all some of my best friends. When you make music together and have to struggle together to make something much greater than the sum of its parts, I think these, these are relationships that you cannot change. And I know that you know that yes. <laughs> really well. So I've, I've seen those amazing recordings that you've made okay. with your friends. And it's, it feeds me too to see those. Oh, that's really, really great to hear because that's the whole point of it. And I hear that from so many musicians and myself is that's, it's, it's your family. It becomes your family, those connections and how deep those connections are. You share something that's yeah. really special and yeah. you can't change that. And that's a great segue to a great friend of our, both of ours, Dan Coleman, who wrote a piece called Sonata for Trumpet and Piano that is the second piece that you picked to play. And again, the technical ability on this is just uh, out of this world. So thank you. Uh, do you want to set this up a little bit for us? How it came to you? Absolutely. So Dan's been a friend of mine for a long time. He was one of the first people I met when we moved to Northfield. I got to know his music through a number of different venues and in a number of different situations. And my, my children actually were in a musical that was produced at the Northfield Arts Guild called Donata's Gift. And I was just really taken with both the melodies and the harmonies of that piece. I mean, I thought, man, this, this would make a fantastic trumpet piece. You may not know that Dan Coleman is an accomplished trombone player as well. So he's a brass player. And I, I said, Dan, you can write any piece that you want, but I wonder if you'd be willing to write a trumpet sonata, like a sub substantive piece, three full movements, um, that uses some of the same type of harmonies and melodies that we heard in Donata's Gift. I love that. It's almost like Guy Noir meets a Brahms or something, you know? It's just, cool. it's a very original and absolutely wonderful musical language. So he said, you bet, I'd be happy to do that. So we worked together to, uh, to write a Southeast Minnesota Arts Council grant for several thousand dollars, and he spent a number of months just primarily working on this piece. So Kent McWilliams, another piano colleague of mine at St. Olaf, and I uh, premiered this piece. Actually, we premiered it in Germany because we were, before we, we did a concert tour in Germany, and then we, we did the sonata there, and then we came back and did a number of performances here, and then ultimately, a couple of years later, recorded it at the same time as I recorded this Stockhausen piece. Well, let's take a listen to this piece called uh, Sonata for Trumpet and Piano by Dan Coleman, performed by Marty Hodel and Kent McWilliams. All right, here it is.
This is Pauline Jennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk. You just heard my guest today, Marty Hodo, play his trumpet on Dan Coleman's piece called Sonata for Trumpet and Piano. The amount of control you have over your instrument is mind-blowing, and the tone is always so rich. It's never harsh. So often, a trumpet can be harsh, and it's so sweet the whole way through. It, it, Very kind of you to say. Oh, it's just wonderful. Thank you. I don't know a lot about trumpet, but my ears love what I hear. It loves what I hear. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, this is 20 minutes worth of music. We only played four. We played the middle movement, but it's a 20-minute piece of piano and trumpet. That's got to be tiring. Yes, indeed. In the studio, as you said, you kind of break things up and you can take it in chunks and redo it. But when you do it live, how do you prepare for that? Well, it's a little bit like training for a marathon. So really? if you're going to play an entire solo recital of an hour or an hour, 20 minute program, um, you know, I have to practice in different ways than I do when I'm just playing very hard music with my brass quintet, but it's not nearly so intense. So basically I'll be practicing up to four hours a day um, several weeks in advance, and a lot of it's pacing, just like what you'd have to do if you're training for a long race as a runner. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do too much on consecutive days, so I might do four hours one day and then only an hour and a half to two hours. A lot of it's mental practice, so you're practicing in your head without actually having it on your lips, mm -hmm. and that gives you a little bit of a rest, but you still are getting the benefit of having the music go in your head, and it also strengthens the musical impulse so that you're able to really have a good concept, a strong concept, which is vital for trumpet playing. So trumpet playing, any brass playing, really is like singing in many respects in a number of ways. First of all, you're using your breath to create the sound. Secondly, if you don't hear the sound exactly before you play it, you're going to play a wrong note because you can play a lot of notes with the same fingering. So a part of that's that. For me, a lot of preparing is trying to get into the depth of the mood and the character. What is each phrase expressing? Is this a somber phrase? Is this intense? Is this supposed to be ugly and dissonant? Or is it just serene and as smooth as you can make it? And is that love? Is that angst? What is it? And what character can you bring to each phrase to really make the music come alive behind the notes? That's what I do when I'm preparing for a recital. Yeah, so folks out there, listen to what he just said. I mean, it is, you just have no idea when you listen to music, the preparation that goes into that and the thought and the thoughtfulness that you, you, that you bring to it. I love that. I've always wondered about trumpet playing and about what you just said earlier about you, you have the same fingering for different notes. So on a piano, you play a note. It's, it is that note, period. How do you, with the same fingering, sound different notes? Your lips vibrate at different speeds, and the, the sound waves of the instrument, the bore of the instrument, interact with the sound waves in your mouth, and the way that you compress your lips, kind of make them a little bit firmer in order to play higher, and also your tongue is raised in the back to play higher and lower. So I can probably play, I don't know, 11 different notes or 12 different notes on the same fingering by doing that. That's how brass players work. Also, the space in your mouth is a big deal. So the, low, the larger the space in your mouth, the lower the note generally, and the, high, the smaller the space in your mouth, including your tongue raising up, the higher the note. There's so much to be in control of that you have to have control of in order to play that instrument well. It it's seems... really easy to, to miss notes on the trumpet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least it is for me. <laughs> yeah, again, I highly doubt that. But, you know, we are almost out of time here. And uh, I want to play best gig, worst gig before we go, because that's always so much fun. And we'll start with the worst gig so that we can end with the, on a positive note. One of my worst gigs was when I played for a very conservative church in North Carolina that thought the end of the world was coming. And they asked me to play fanfares that were supposed to be the trumpets of Revelation coming as they baptized every single unbaptized person, including little babies and little kids in that church. And originally that they told me it would be about an hour and it lasted four hours. And finally, I just packed up my trumpet and said, I'm not getting paid. I'm just leaving. Wow. So Apocalypse. you're heralding the end of the world. Yeah. And uh, it didn't happen. 
It and did. that was in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad it didn't happen. That is, that's a, that's a tough gig. Four hours. No, 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 no. Okay, so the now best gig, what, and I'm sure you've had many, but what it, what comes to mind? Well, that's a little bit like asking your favorite food. Yeah. So there are so many, but there's one that comes to mind, and several times I've had the opportunity to play the Resurrection Symphony of Gustav Mahler, his symphony number no. two with the Minnesota Orchestra, and to play that with amazing soloists and a huge chorus and one of the best yeah. orchestras on the planet is all encompassing it's just you can't describe it did you feel a little bit out of your body in a situation like that quite a bit yeah Mahler second with Minnesota Orchestra it doesn't get any better than that awesome I would leave it on that note except to say I think my favorite gig of yours would have been with the who but whatever <laughs> that's all I'm saying it was really fun <laughs> sure. that's great oh what fun I've had today and you've taught me a lot and I think our audience has learned a lot, certainly have gotten to know you better. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. And it's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk with you a little bit. Thank you so much, Marty. That means a lot. Take care. Thanks to Marty Hodel for sharing so much of his musical journey with us today. Thank you to Fairfield Bar for sponsoring today's show. And as always, many, many thanks to all of you for listening to Musician Talk on KYMN.